Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning everyone. So, previous class we have learned about what are surface properties and uh, what are the different techniques we can use for characterizing those surface properties. Today we will be learning about the bulk properties. So, what are bulk properties? So, other than the outer surface of a material, all other section is bulk section only. So, for, uh, for the material to be used for the implant, first that bulk property has to be satisfied. So, that it has to be mimicking the already existing natural material. Then only we can go for surface analysis and those things for the making it more biocompatible. So, what are the bulk properties? They are elastic behavior whether it can be extended uh, based on the application, stress and strain, tension, compression and shear stress, fatigue and creep. Bulk property is totally different from surface where it will not have any reaction with the system, but it, it is majorly for the orthopedic implants where there is a load bearing applications and all involved. So, why it is important? Because uh, if you consider the orthopedic implants, uh, once you uh, surgically insert it into the body, it has to be there for lifelong and it has to maintain its function all over that period. To have that uh, capability, we have to characterize that uh, uh, mechanical property of the implants. So, consider the invertebral disc which is uh, uh, inserted into the vertebra of a human. So, for each position, the load applied onto that invertebral disc is different. As you can see, uh, in normal supine position which is lying down, it is load on the disc could be 294 Newton only. But if you are standing and walking and all, it increases gradually due to the force applied on the vertebral. And if you are lifting, that load would be further increased. So, your material has to have that wide range of uh, load bearing uh, uh, capacity so that it can be uh, in the host system for prolonged period of time. Because if there is a failure, and if you are inserting an implant at the age of 30, around 50, if it fails, then you have to go for again surgery which has a higher risk and all. So, bulk property thus plays a major role for the longer patency of the implant. And what are the major obstacles in these uh, bulk properties? Sir? One is uh, corrosion and due to the excessive uh, usage of the implant inside the body, uh, the material can uh, uh, break down into smaller uh, smaller pieces which will cause us further uh, complication in the biological system. Okay. So, the fundamental concepts in the mechanical properties are stress. Stress is when a uh, force is applied onto the surface uh, that is uh, uh, called stress. So, the mathematical term is stress equal to force by area. So, you are applying a force on a specific cross sectional of a material. So, that is the stress. So, based on this stress, uh, the material will go and uh, deformation. So, if there is a uh, dental implant, so while you are eating and all, so that stress would be applied on the uh, dental implant. So, that has to maintain its integrity. So, that deformation is called strain. So, strain is change in the length by uh, original length, initial length. So, based on these two uh, factors, uh, there is a relation called Hooke's law, uh, which uh, introduces a new parameter called Young's modulus, which is a ratio of stress by strain. So, this is an important and commonly used parameter in all of the biomaterials for while defining a mechanical property of that material. So, other properties related to this uh, 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 tensile strengths are elastic modulus, yield strength, uh, ultimate tensile strength, ductility and toughness. So, these properties I will explain while uh, explaining this stress strain curve. So, you know what is stress and what is strain. 
So, if you have a relation based on this stress and strain, uh, if there is a increase in stress, there would be an increase in strain. So, the initial proportionate linear increase is called, uh, in that linear increase the region is called elastic region. So, in that elastic region, uh, what it represents is, if a material, if it is in the elastic region, even if that strain, due to the strain, if it forms, a, if it deforms into a different uh, structure, then it can retain back it, back into its original structure. It is like a rubber band where you extend it. So, if you leave it, it can come back into uh, the original uh, shape, original length. So, in that region is called elastic region. So, there is a particular uh, uh, region where if you extend it further more, it will cause a breakage of the rubber band. So, that region is called plasticity region where it cannot come back to its original region. So, um, so, the initial region is called uh, elastic region. So, up to this the stress and strain would be very linearly proportional. Then after it is the uh, yield point is there. So, after this yield point the material cannot go back to its original state. Okay, so, if you are having an implant uh, polymer materials used for the uh, vascular grafts, catheters and all. So, if that material, if the force applied on the material is going beyond that yield point, its shape can uh, change into a different one. So, that will cause uh, problems while uh, uh, introducing into the biological system. So, your material has to be below that yield point, whatever the force uh, which is uh, naturally occurring for that material, the application based on the application that should be below that yield point. So, the ultimate strength, ultimate strength is the maximum load that material can uh, withstand. So, uh, considering a hip uh, prosthesis, so if you are introducing into the system, the maximum load where that material can withstand even if it deforms, that is the ultimate strength. So, after that if uh, you continue to give the load, then that material will break. So, that is called rupture strength. So, this is a typical stress strain curve, but for different uh, types of biomaterials, the stress strain curve varies because uh, uh, polymers will have a higher elasticity and everything, whereas ceramics has uh, uh, no elasticity at all. So, as you can see, the brittle ceramic uh, aluminum oxides, it has a initial Young's modulus, then after that, if you give a load, it will break. There is no point of elongation or anything for the ceramic. Then for brittle metals like cobalt, chromium alloys and uh, uh, titanium, for ductile metals like titanium alloys and all, there would be a little bit elongation, then after which it uh, breaks down. In polymer also, there is a thermosetting polymer such as uh, epoxy polymers, uh, uh, those kind of polymers, it is uh, uh, very brittle in nature. So, it cannot have that elastic point. So, these epoxy polymers and all used for the uh, adhesive uh, surgical glues and adhesive uh, things. So, they will immediately seal off the wounds, so that uh, uh, it should not leak anything. So, those materials would be very brittle. So, those things would not have any elasticity and all. Then ductile polymers or all other uh, low density polymers, uh, polyethylene, uh, then uh, carbohydrate polymers, all those materials will have a higher range of elasticity. Uh, such as PVA, uh, chitosan, polyethylene, so normal plastic uh, polyethylene. So, if you can extend it can go for a very longer uh, length and all. So, that polymers will have a different uh, Young's modulus and different plasticity region. So, based on this you have to decide and the application you are going to use, you have to decide the material and characterize whether these materials has the same property as that of naturally occurring material. So, like if you are uh, introducing a new vascular grafts and all, that vascular grafts has to uh, has the uh, mechanical property such that it can withstand the force of the bloodstream uh, passing through that graft. And if you are going for the uh, hip prosthetics and all. So, you have to look for how the loads and all uh, applying on the region around the hip prosthetics, so that it does not uh, uh, break or it does not uh, fall above the yield strength. Okay. So, how we can find out all these parameters, Young's modulus, ultimate strength and uh, uh, fracture and uh, that uh, rupture point and all. So, that can be found using universal testing machine. So, in this machine you can do variety of uh, tests where 
uh, each of the test will give a different uh, uh, parameters. So, this is how the instrument will look like. So, instrument the bottom one is called uh, mounted head. So, it is a immovable uh, head. So, the bottom, so you can see the two clamps. So, in between those two clamps only we will fix the sample. Okay. So, the top one is a movable head. So, in that one it will load cell would be there at the top. So, the load cell will apply the force on the sample. So, and it will tension will applied onto the sample. So, that will introduce stress and then the change in length will be calculated uh, by the sensors. So, which will from that we can calculate the ultimate strength, yield strength uh, and rupture point and Young's modulus and all. So, for different application different clamps would be available as you can see uh, one is for uh, tension. So, tension uh, stress is where you elongate a sample. So, that is the tension stress and compression. Compression is where you compress the sample. So, that uh, uh, the material how much the load it can compress into a smaller uh, in, in on that material surface. Then bending where the material would be kept and there would be a bending at a different points and all. So, there is a based on the application. So, if you are the, uh, having a screw plates and all in the uh, uh, legs and this prosthetics. Uh, so, there the bending would be different based on the how many screws and nuts uh, you are uh, introducing into the plates. So, based on that you can go for 3 point bending, 4 point bending to exactly characterize how that will function inside the biological system. Then torsion and all, uh, so there would be a twisting uh, occurs on the sample. So, this kind of uh, testing will be done for the ligaments and all. So, where the ligaments would has to be turned so that it does not uh, uh, break or the rupture uh, during that torsion uh, stress. Then in plane shear is mainly for the hip prosthetics where there would be a metal metal contact there would be a shear stress applied whenever that uh, ball and uh, uh, cup would be moving uh, over the uh, plane. So, that will be found out using the shear, state, shear stress in plane uh, uh, testing. So, all this uh, can be done for different size of samples, different uh, sample dimension and uh, uh, all the metals, polymers, ceramics and everything. So, using this instrument you can find out all the mechanical properties and all. And uh, can see in that uh, sample dimension it looks like a dog bone shape. So, it is an important uh, factor that if you are keeping a single uh, lengthy rectangular sample and all. So, the breakage would occur at the uh, where you are clamping the sample. So, that is not the actual uh, tension stress uh, applied onto that sample. So, they make a dog bone shape so that the sample at the ends would be thicker so that it would clamp and the breakage would occur at the sample middle only. So, that will give the uh, exact value of uh, how that stress strain uh, observation will be occurring. So, usually we consider, so when a stress is applied the strain will instantaneously uh, produced. So, that is how our idea was. So, but it does not actually follow that uh, all over the uh, period. Um, so, consider different parameters such as temperature, uh, frequency and time. So, based on these parameters with the constant stress also it can have a different strain. So, in the stress strain curve if you can see the applied stress the strain with it. So, if you increase the stress strain with it, but if you apply a constant stress also the uh, strain can vary. So, that is a dynamical mechan dynamic mechanical testing and all. So, why this is important? So, temperature as I said earlier dental implants and all where you can have a, a change in temperature like uh, while you eating ice cream or the hot soup. So, the temperature changes. So, the implant should maintain its integrity. So, to identify whether that affects that mechanical property the same uh, normal room temperature if you are applying a load onto a material that will have a different effect when the temperature is very cold. So, those things has to be calculated. Then frequency, frequency is uh, how much time uh, a material is being uh, uh, used for that specific application. Uh, consider the hip prosthetics where it has to move uh, while walking uh, how many 
uh, distance, how much distance you are uh, walking and all based on that the frequency varies. Uh, consider the hot walls and all. So, hot walls has to function a uh, lot number of times uh, for, the, for the minute it, it has to uh, beat for 72, around 72 beats. So, consider for the minute it is like that then for the day how much beats it has to be there and for the year and for the prolonged period of time how much time the walls has to open and close. So, over those periods what happens is the material is in contact with the nearby uh, surfaces and all. So, there would be some corrosion, there would be some uh, surface etching and erosion that will reduce the efficiency of that material. So, those factors has to be tested before uh, uh, clinically use that uh, hot walls and these uh, materials and all. So, what are these properties change uh, changing based on this frequency and time all. So, time dependent properties are the, uh, some of the there are a lot of properties. So, these are the widely used properties uh, uh, creep or recovery test relaxation test. So, creep or recovery test is that uh, it is where uh, in creep or recovery test the stress would be maintained constant whereas, the strain would vary. So, if you consider the ligament. So, as you can see in the figure, uh, the weight WT has been uh, load that is the load has been given. So, uh, when it is given at the time point T, the it, it will not uh, elongate if it is uh, uh, within that uh, linear range of the stress strain curve. After the particular period of time, it tends to elongate. Okay. So, that is the percentage uh, elongation changing that is what it is changing. So, how much that time can affect that uh, uh, strain on based on a constant uh, stress. So, that is creep or recovery test. Then relaxation test it is exact opposite of the creep, or creep test where the strain would be kept, kept constant, the elongation would be kept constant, but the load will vary. So, how much load it can vary based to maintain that elongation. So, these things would be very useful when you are the uh, designing a new uh, material and also that the material should not uh, go, uh, go to a point where it uh, cannot uh, recover its uh, original state back. Okay. So, for those things these time dependent properties will uh, involve and to identify that material prolonged usage we will uh, study these time dependent properties. Frequency dependent properties. So, frequency dependent properties as I have said earlier the number of frequency your material is being used like in the hot walls and hip prosthetics. So, wear and tear it is the major problem in orthopedic implants where the material would be in contact with the nearby materials and all. So, due to the frequency high number of frequency we are using that uh, material inside the biological system uh, the surface will get eroded and uh, uh, that will lose its uh, functionality, lose its efficiency. Fatigue is again the same thing uh, where uh, you are not in fatigue, you are below the yield point only. Uh, the number of uh, the load we are giving is below the uh, yield point only, but o due to the over usage of the uh, implants. Uh, uh, for that application the material will lose its efficiency that is called fatigue it will lose its uh, uh, functionality. Um, so, this usually happens uh, uh, when the material you are designing it should be almost similar to that natu natural uh, material like the metal implants it should be similar to the bone. Uh, imp bone already present. If it is above also what happens is that there is a stress shielding effect hap it can happen. So, st stress shielding effect is uh, an effect where if a material can uh, have a load of uh, around uh, uh, 500 Newton, if we make that material into a 1000 Newton uh, it can have that much capacity of uh, 1000 Newton material. What happens it, it can have that all the load uh, by itself and it would not pass on to the nearby bones and all. So, what happens due to that is the bones surrounding that material will get uh, lose its integrity and it would be weaker compared to the normal bones. So, that is 
by this material it is shielding the stress of the nearby natural materials and all that by reducing its uh, uh, integrity. So, that is one of a major problem uh, in orthopedic implants. So, those things will have, uh, come when fatigue is uh, also involved. So, it can seal the stress of the uh, load and thereby reducing the integrity of the bone implants. So, those are the basic properties and characterization uh, we can do for the bulk uh, properties of the material. Uh, consider uh, hydrogels and scaffolds. So, those have uh, different properties rather than this uh, polymer flames and metal implants and all. So, you might have already studied what are hydrogels and scaffolds. So, hydrogels are uh, gels which can have a uh, water intake, higher amount of water intake and scaffolds are the, uh, polymeric uh, scaffolds which can be used for the cell uh, tissue regeneration process and all. So, what are the properties uh, important for these hydrogels and scaffolds, some uh, basic properties uh, which defines them. So, you can do all the surface characterization and bulk characterization for these uh, hydrogels and scaffolds also. Other than those properties, these properties also involved. Uh, porosity, swelling, degradation, kinetics and the thermal behavior. So, porosity, so porosity for the scaffold, porosity is an important factor because porosity will help in uh, cell attachment in depth of that scaffold and uh, the number of pores uh, will help in transfer of uh, nutrients inside and outside the uh, scaffolds. So, to identify the porosity of the material uh, tissue engineering scaffold. Uh, normal techniques like SEM, TEM, mercury porosimeter and gas pycnometry can be used. So, in TEM and uh, SEM you can visually, uh, visually see the porous structure. So, as you can see the SEM image, the porous uh, scaffold is seen, uh, but this in SEM image you can see at the surface only. So, you cannot uh, say it confirmed that inside also the porous structure would be there maybe the inside it would be a compact bulk structure and the surface would be a porous structure. In TEM, uh, you can actually say that the material is completely porous because due to the transmission electrons, you can see what is inside the material and all. So, if a material is completely porous inside, you can find out using that TEM. Other than these sophisticated techniques, you can use mercury porosimeter and gas pycnometry, which uh, uses a uh, Archimedes principle of liquid displacement, where uh, you have a, how the experiment for this uh, finding the porosity goes is that you will have a liquid. Uh, in mercury porosimeter, you will insert the porous structure inside. So, the porous and you apply a vacuum also. So, the air would be sucked out of the system and uh, all the pores inside will be filled by mercury. So, those by that. Uh, then you take out the scaffold and uh, weigh the amount of uh, scaffold before keeping it into, into that uh, mercury and after that and based on the uh, volume you can actually calculate the porosity. So, mercury porosity and gas pycnometry it involves gas and uh, commonly used uh, another liquid is that uh, ethanol. So, by ethanol because uh, uh, it can, uh, it won't involve in uh, swelling of the materials and all. Uh, some of most of the materials would be hydrophilic, so it can. If you are using water and all, it can uh, absorb water and it can swell and all. It's not actually the porous volume. So the volume would be based on the polymer scaffold also. So using ethanol will have a better, uh, uh, th better than the water the experiment. So porosity. Uh, formula is that a final weight minus initial weight by volume uh, and density of the ethanol used. So, how much of volume and density of the ethanol you are using. So, that will give you the porosity of the scaffold. Okay. So, swelling study is uh, predominantly used for hydrogels because the uptake of water uh, is majorly influences the kinetics of the molecules loading and releasing from the gels. So, a material which can swell faster can uh, uh, mean that the water intake is uh, higher, so that the 
nutrients or uh, any other drugs or molecules which you are uh, incorporating into the hydrogel can be released faster. So, if uh, swelling is slower, then the release would be slower. So, that defines uh, how the kinetics uh, uh, mostly in drug delivery application and all how this uh, kinetics uh, would be uh, factored would be affected by this swelling study. So, for swelling uh, analysis uh, similar to that uh, uh, what you do is uh, you weigh the samples before the uh, keeping it into water then you uh, keep it in water then you again weigh the sample. So, that will the difference in that weight uh, by the initial weight uh, final weight is the uh, uh, percentage degree of swelling. So, usually for hydrogels uh, be, uh, for the application wise you can actually use this degree of swelling uh, to understand that uh, uh, the rate of drug release and all. So, if it is a uh, uncross linked the polymer hydrogels and all the swelling would be faster and if it is a cross linked the hydrogel the swelling would be slower. So, to understand the kinetics of the release profile you can uh, use this uh, swelling uh, you can study this swelling. So, degradation. So, degradation is an important parameter for both the hydrogels and uh, uh, scaffolds uh, because uh, uh, nowadays uh, most of the implants are coming as a uh, biodegradable implants where when it is implanted into the body instead of uh, having an uh, another surgery to remove those uh, implants uh, these things can degrade by itself such as uh, the switches, uh, uh, resolvable screws and all where you implant it uh, uh, for the metal plates and the sutures for the uh, internal uh, sutures and all. So, uh, over the pre initially it should function like a normal suture where the, uh, where it should uh, it should have all the mechanical property and all the physical property of the uh, norm, like the normal suture uh, then after over the period of time when the wound heals that should be degraded by the biological system in the and it should be uh, washed away from the system so this should be tested with the biological fluids uh, and enzymes so based on the application you are using. So, the biodegradation is calculated by uh, initial weight minus uh, final weight after it is degraded by the uh, final weight will give you the biodegradation. So, this will help you understand how long a material can degrade. So, based on that you can design them. So, if you want your material to be degraded uh, uh, within uh, a week or within a month then you have to uh, complete degradation should be there uh, within the month the final value will be around uh, 0 or 2. So, that it should be uh, completely replaced by the natural uh, tissue ok. So, those are the uh, normal physiochemical properties for the scaffolds and uh, hydrogels. Coming into thermal behavior. So, thermal behavior is uh, uh, like I said for the implants uh, uh, for dental implants uh, and for normal polymeric materials also uh, you have to understand the, uh, the effect of temperature on the material. So, that can be found out using DSC and TGA. So, this is a commonly used these two are commonly used techniques other than this there are other thermal characterization techniques also. So, DSC it involves uh, what it actually finds out is that the material uh, melting point, crystallization point, uh, then the glass transition temperature, then the phase change of the polymers. So, those things can be found out using uh, differential scanning colorimeter. So, the instrumentation involves uh, as you can see in the picture uh, there are two one is a reference and another is a sample. Uh, in the sample uh, pan we will keep the our material and in the reference pan it would be a empty pan or you can have a reference uh, comparable material center. So, what happens is uh, you will apply a constant temperature onto the both the sample and reference at the same time at the same temperature. So, what happens is that if your material uh, exert heats like uh, uh, releases heat by exothermic reaction or endothermic reaction it absorbs heat there would be a change in the heat flow. So, that would be detected. So, the based on that you can actually plot this uh, uh, 
DSC thermogram where you can find out the melting point, uh, uh, crystallization point and uh, degradation point of the materials. So, as you can see the in first when it um, polymeric materials uh, if it is amorphous polymers it will go a glass transition uh, change. So, it can go from a brittle nature into a rubbery nature. So, above glass transition temperature the molecule will be uh, arranged uh, randomly. So, that will have a uh, rubbery nature that is the temperature uh, uh, called glass transition temperature. So, glass transition temperature after that it will molecules will arrange uh, orderly fashion where it is uh, you can find out the crystallization temperature. So, after that molecule tends to melt. So, that is the melting temperature. Then if there is a chemical reaction due to the temperature. So, that is the uh, exothermic behavior you are seeing. Then finally, the degradation occurs where the material is completely degraded due to the temperature. So, these uh, temperatures and uh, all these temperatures are uh, very essential uh, when you are uh, uh, using a thermo responsive gels and uh, uh, other temperature involving uh, implants and devices. For uh, it can also be used uh, uh, for characterizing new biomaterial where uh, you are having a cross linked or a mixture of two materials and all there would be a difference in or shifting in the temperature in the glass transition temperature and uh, change in uh, melting temperature and all it will occur because uh, higher the cross linking the melting temperature will vary. So, based on that uh, you can identify that your cross link has occurred or your uh, material uh, properties has changed due to the incorporation of a new molecule into the uh, samples and all. So, that can be found out using this uh, differential scanning colorimeter. Thermogravity analysis is uh, similar to DSC only, the mechanism is uh, similar to DSC only, but here the, it involves uh, as the name suggests uh, the gravimetry which is a uh, weighing of the uh, material. So, the instrumentation is almost similar, it, nowadays the advanced instruments has both DSC and uh, uh, TGA is available. So, where in the DSC where you can change, you can observe the change in temperature due to the material. Uh, when the heat is supplied. Here due to the heat is supplied you can actually uh, um, measure the minute change in the weight. So, you will use a sample of around uh, 20 mg or 5 mg only for the each of them. So, that can be that minute change in temperature can be observed using this uh, thermogravimetric analysis. So, this mainly uh, helps us to identify how the degradation occurs for the material and all. So, Typical thermogram will looks like uh, that uh, right corner you can see that. Uh, so, around 100 degree Celsius uh, due to the increase in, so in DSC and TGA there would be a constant increase in temperature we will be supplying. Um, so, initial increase in temperature there would be a volatile compounds like uh, uh, moisture, water absorbed or any solvents present it would get evaporated from the system. So, that would be a you can see there is a uh, decrease in the weight percentage that is uh, the initial stage. Then the second stage would be the decrease in the polymer, uh, decrease in the weight uh, due to the polymer degradation. So, that is uh, in the second stage. Then the final stage where it is completely turned out into an uh, as which is uh, degraded polymers everything has been completely turned into carbon. Okay. So, the interpretation for this TG analysis it uh, if it is uh, there is your material is not affected by any temperature and all uh, the line would be a very straight line. Then in the curve 2 uh, you can see there is a decreasing sudden decrease and it became uh, uh, stabilized that usually denotes that uh, your material uh, some moisture or some solvents are there. So, which is getting evaporated. Uh, not a degradation of a compound or molecule present on the scaffolds that is the curve 2. Then in curve 3 it is a single stage decomposition. So, if your material is made up of a single polymer or single uh, material uh, metals or something uh, ceramics and all. So, there would be a single degradation of that uh, particular uh, molecule only. So, that can be observed due to the uh, uh, single uh, uh, loss of the weight. If your material is having a multiple uh, 
polymers like uh, interpenetrating networks where you have a couple of polymers or alloys uh, where you use uh, silver, titanium alloys and all. So those will have a, each material will have a different degradation temperature. So the lower degradation temperature, first step would be the, those materials will get degraded. Then simultaneously based on the degradation temperature, it varies. In step 5, uh, if it is not a step wise, if it is just gradually decreasing, it means that uh, you are actually heating it very fast so that your uh, uh, instrument cannot measure the exact weight of that uh, material or scaffolds present. There can be some increase in weight also. That happens when your material is reactive to the atmosphere present inside the system. So usually uh, it would be an inert atmosphere uh, such as uh, we can use such as nitrogen or argon and all. But if you are using a normal atmospheric condition, there would be oxidation occurs which can lead to the increase in the weight of the mm, material. So the final one uh, is again uh, after decomposition, it can those decomposition products can interact with the uh, atmospheric uh, uh, compounds and reactive species so that it can uh, lead to an increase in that. Uh, uh, weight. So, this can also happen in magnetic uh, uh, samples also, there would be an increase in weight also. So, by uh, characterizing these thermal properties, you will know that uh, your material is pure or if you are, whatever you are incorporating into your material can have a, any thermal effect onto the final material. So, those things can be analyzed using these techniques and all. So, understanding this both the uh, bulk properties and the surface properties will have a clear idea of how exactly you want to use that material for your applications and all. So after finishing these two characterization, you have to go for your the biological characterization where you can check for the protein adsorption, uh, cell attachment and if you are uh, working on a antibacterial adhesion or biofilm formation to avoid biofilm formation. So, those things and all come under the biological characterization, how effectively it can improve or decrease the attachment of the biological system. So, before going that you have to understand these parameters and these characterization techniques has to be done for all the materials you are trying to do.